Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your tour guide for today's ride. Episode 4 Role Playing Games in the 1970s. So, through four episodes of Role Playing History, we've been very Dungeons and Dragons centric. Now, that's not overly surprising considering D&D started the genre. However, once TSR was created and D&D came out, other game companies were created and got into the mix. What they created and how they impacted the game helped form role-playing into what it is today. In fact, it only took a year for the first competitor to D&D to be released. In 1975, Flying Buffalo Inc. released Tunnels and Trolls. Designed by Ken St. Andre, it has been touted as a more accessible alternative to D&D. St. Andre self-published the first edition before Flying Buffalo released a second edition later in 1975. While Tunnels and Trolls had similar stats, classes, and adventurer types as D&D, it introduced a point-based magic system and it only used six-sided dice. Writer Michael Tresca summed it up best by saying Tunnels and Trolls, quote, explained its rules better, end quote. Tunnels and Trolls quickly became D&D's biggest competitor and has survived nine editions. The most recent was published in 2015. One other note, Tunnels and Trolls was translated and published in the UK, Germany, France, Italy, Finland, and Japan before D&D was. Fantasy Games Unlimited entered the role-playing game field in 1977 with Chivalry and Sorcery. Created by Edward Symbolist and Wilf Backhouse, it was created because they didn't like the lack of realism in D&D, so they used D&D rules to create what they hoped would be a better gaming system. Their goal was to try to sell Gary Gygax on the idea at Gen Con 1977, but instead wound up meeting Scott Bizarre, the founder of Fantasy Games Unlimited. He liked what they had, and they signed a letter of intent to publish. However, if you think back over the past few episodes of this show, lawsuits and cease and desist letters were prevalent during this time. So, to avoid any of those, Bizarre, Symbolist, and Backhouse scrubbed the game clean of its D&D remnants, then published it. This first edition of the game had an interesting cost-cutting trick. They photo-reduced four pages of copy onto each page of the book. It saved space, but it made the book really hard to read. The influence of chivalry and sorcery was medieval France and Christianity, and included things like knights and a hierarchical priesthood, among other things. Now, chivalry and sorcery is still being printed, with the fifth edition released by Britannia Game Designs in 2020. Overall, reviewers have enjoyed Chivalry and Sorcery, but they've also noted the same thing. These rules are complicated, so if you're going to try it, just be aware. The publisher of the Chaosium got into the field next. RuneQuest was released in 1978, and it brought the concept of skills to the world of role-playing games. In a D&D world, these are things like athletics, acrobatics, and the like. The game was designed around percentile dice, which for the uninitiated are two dice. Both are 10 sided, but one is marked 10 through 00, zero and the other 0 through 9. Roll them both, then you read the first die is the 100 and the second is the 1. That means a roll of 80 and 8 would be 88, and a roll of 00, zero and 0 would be 100. Shortly after its release, RuneQuest became the second most popular role-playing game behind D&D. Reviewers tended to like it as well, though no single reviewer I found ever gave it higher than an 8.5 out of 10. Still, a solid B is a good grade and would lead many gamers to at least try the game out. And RuneQuest has survived. It's gone through seven editions, multiple changes in publishers, and was even part of a successful Kickstarter campaign to get an edition published. So I think it's safe to say RuneQuest continues to this day to be a very popular game. Now, by now, you've probably realized I'm not diving as deep into these games as I did with D&D. I want to take a second and make something clear. It's not a lack of respect. Since to this point we've covered only fantasy games, it's a safe assumption that they all play 
basically the same with the rule adjustments I've noted being you know, the difference in the case. This also leaves us the option later on to do some deep dives on the games our listeners would like to hear more about. By the way, drop us an email to the show or a post to the Facebook site if you're interested in a deeper dive on any of these games or any of the games coming up. All right, at this point, I want to roll back two years on the timeline to 1976. That's when science fiction role-playing games began with the publishing of Metamorphous Alpha. Created by James M. Ward, it was published by TSR, which makes them the first to publish a fantasy role-playing game and the first to produce a science fiction role-playing game. The space, specifically spaceship, setting was new to the genre. However, from a nuts and bolts standpoint, the game featured pretty much the same characteristics as D&D, but with a new outer space setting. Reviews of the game were mixed. Some writers loved it, while others called it a space-based rehash of D&D. Metamorphosis Alpha survived four editions, but has also had two modern-day reprints updates of the first edition. I got a couple more notes on this game. One. James M. Ward himself stated that the game had more hard science and should therefore be considered science fantasy rather than science fiction. Two, in 1980, TSR released an AD&D module, number S3, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. This was a soft intro to this game. Settings are, are pretty similar. And three, yeah, I know I said a couple, but I can't do math. I found this piece really interesting. James M. Ward holds all the rights to Metamorphosis Alpha. This includes rights to materials originally published in Dragon Magazine. Now, while licensing deals in the business world are normal, I've rarely come across one that allows the creator to keep the rights to all of the materials tied to the idea, especially things published in a magazine owned by the game's publisher. It does happen from time to time, but not as frequently as you might think. 1977 brought another sci-fi role-playing game to the table, Traveler. Designed by Mark W. Miller, Frank Chadwick, John Harshman, and Lauren K. Wiseman, Traveler is a true space adventure as characters travel between various star systems to explore, get involved in ground and space battles, and conduct trade. Traveler's immediate difference from all its predecessors was at experience points, which to this point had been the be-all, end-all of determining advancement, weren't used. Instead, character advancement came from achievements, which were story-based and came either at the discretion of the GM or as noted in a published adventure. In other words, the GM would determine that completing X number of missions would equate to increasing by a level, or that completing maybe one big assignment could. In a published adventure, they tended to note when the group should be leveled up based on the amount of interaction and adventure that they'd had to that point. Also, this idea is utilized in D&D 5th edition as one of two methods to advance characters with the standard experience points being the other. Now, on a side note, you may notice my changing from DM or Dungeon Master to GM or Game Master. While DM was always really kind of intended to be a D&D specific term for the person running the game, most fantasy-based games use that term. However, if you're not in a fantasy-based game, meaning no dungeons, it makes better sense to use the GM term. And in fact, many groups just use the GM term for all games, regardless of genre. Now, Miller was influenced by a variety of sci-fi novels in creating his game, and he noted that these books grounded the game with a sense of realism, such as limited communications through space, conflict resolution, diversity, and morals. A number of writers noted at the time that this was different from many other role-playing games, across all genres even, as some of those issues either were insufficiently addressed or they just weren't addressed at all. Traveler was published by Game Designers Workshop, and the original version is known as the Little Black Books. That's because they were pamphlet size, they were black, and it took three of them to hold the core rules in the first edition box. Now, not only were the rules published like this, but all of the early supplements for the game were as well. Since they're out of print, those originals can fetch a pretty penny if you can still find them. And while there are technically only two editions of Traveler, there have been 11 different printings and publications of the rules 
with multiple companies involved with the brand over the years. And there's a good reason for that. Reviewers and gamers alike just love this game. Nearly every review I read online was extremely positive, and several writers gushed about the superiority of Traveler over D&D. TSR entered a second game into the sci-fi role-playing game realm in 1978. Called Gamma World, it borrowed heavily from Metamorphosis Alpha in its creation. That's not a surprise, since James M. Ward, who created Metamorphosis Alpha, was the co-creator of Gamma World with Gary Jaquette. Now, while Gamma World was marketed as a sci-fi role-playing game, its true genre would really be termed post-apocalyptic. Gamma World is set in the mid-25th century after a second nuclear war destroys human civilization, and it plays as a very gritty survivalist story. Gamma World really changed the scope of the role-playing game, especially in how it changed Earth, which was the setting. Radiation is everywhere, thanks to all the nukes. Conflicts are nearly constant, thanks to the need to survive. Sort of like Mad Max without all the leather, in, in my opinion. Anyway. While the settings and flavors are well established, it should be noted that through the various editions of the game, and there are seven of them, the levels of technology available and the reasons why some are and some aren't vary from quasi-medieval to advanced. One note about the game I saw online about first edition, I think it was, stated that the crossbow was to be considered, quote, the ultimate weapon, end quote while later editions had advanced weaponry that we don't even have in 2021. Genetic mutation was an addition to this game, much as you'd expect from a setting with all that nuclear radiation, and it impacted character creation. Otherwise, character creation was a lot like most of the other games that were out there. Reviews of Gamma World were mostly positive, and the fact that it kept getting reprinted shows its popularity. And I should note, that the third edition of this game won the 1986-87 Gamer's Choice Award for Best Science Fiction Role-Playing Game. Okay, so we've looked at fantasy role-playing games. We've looked at science fiction role-playing games. How about let's roll this timeline back a year and check out the first entry into the superhero genre. Superhero 2044, released in 1977, was the first superhero role-playing game. Created by Donald Saxman, it's set in the year 2044 after a global holocaust. By the way, what the hell's the deal with global holocausts in all these role-playing games? I mean, holy crap. Anyway, character creation was way different than what we've seen before. 140 points were to be distributed over seven characteristics. Then, those scores would be further adjusted after the player chose a specialization for their character. Gameplay was also different. It was split into two parts, face-to-face -face scenarios and the rest of the week's activities. Face-to-face -face scenarios are similar to pretty much every other role-playing game. These are the encounters and the adventures that you play in every session. However, the rest of the week's activities were literally each player writing out a weekly planning sheet, noting what their character was doing and when they were doing it, patrolling, researching, etc. This was considered as important to the game as the face-to-face -face scenarios. Now, shortly after the initial production, which Saxman did on its own, Luzaki, who is a name in the gaming world we'll be examining in depth another time, financed a 50-page ring-bound book, which was the first ring-bound role-playing game sold. 2044 also got one published adventure, Hazard, from Judges Guild. And reviews of the game were what I'd call, meh. While reviewers did call it groundbreaking, and many found the actual gameplay to be entertaining, nearly all considered the rules complex, with lots of math and charts, and requiring a ton of time to set up before you could even start printing. Now, the 1977 printings of the game are the only ones I'm aware of, and I've scoured the internet to see if there were more. So, if you could find one, I suspect you'll pay good money for it, and it'll be extremely well used. Now, through this point in the show, we've talked about genres of role-playing games. However, other things happened for games during the 70s as well. In fact, we saw the creation of campaign settings for games, which are different from core rulebooks in that they offer a setting for your game. Thus the term. 
This means a city or world typically and gives you adventure hooks to use for your own game. Some are more filled out than others, but that's the basic other than to add that a campaign setting is tied to a specific game type, like D&D or Rare Quest or whatever. Empire of the Petal Throne was technically the first campaign setting, as it was originally conceived with D&D rules. However, since it got its own printing as a separate role-playing game, I have another candidate for the first campaign setting published. City State of the Invincible Overlord, published in 1976 by Judges Guild, is my pick for the first published campaign setting, especially since it was specifically created for use with D&D. Created by Bob Bledsaw and Bill Owen, who are also the founders of Judges Guild, it was based on Bledsaw's personal D&D campaign. The city-state was a single city, a dwarven fortress and town of Thunderhold. It came with a 34-inch by 44-inch four-page map of the town, as well as notable inhabitants, encounters, and rumors for the DM to use. City State of the Invincible Overlord has been revised multiple times, with the last edition printed by Necromancer Games in 2004. The original got rave reviews, because it provided a whole new wealth of information for DMs. Later versions of the game just got a meh. Oh, and I wanted to note, Judges Guild is another one of those topics we're going to cover in depth in a future episode. Damn, I've said that a lot today. I, I need to keep track of this. Live action role play, or LARP, based on the medieval period, also saw popularity during this time. The group Dagger here was formed in 1977 in Washington, D.C. by Brian Weesey. His original vision was for a true LARP, a role playing adventure with the occasional combat. However, that didn't happen. His vision was, for lack of a better term, hijacked, and Dagger here has evolved into a battle game with full contact melee fighting with foam weapons. Should you find yourself interested, there are chapters all over the U.S. and around the globe. Oh, and on a side note, LARPs don't tend to feature actual melee combat. While players are in character throughout the game, any combat or skill checks tend to still be resolved with die rolls, or the storyteller, as the GM tends to be called in these cases, rules without the use of dice. Now, as I noted last week, Gen Con was created as the first role-playing game-specific game convention. However, hundreds of others started up throughout the 1970s, and there are literally thousands around the world today. However, I'm not going to get into them today, as they are, say it with me kids, coming up in a couple of weeks as a standalone part of this podcast. Thanks for the help. One last entry on today's list is the Choose Your Own Adventure series of books. While not a role-playing game in the style we've been discussing today, I do consider them to be a part of the genre for reasons I'll expand on in a minute. The first book was technically released in 1976, but Bantam Books acquired the rights in 1979 and produced the first book in what became a widely enjoyed series. Now, why do I consider these to be part of the role-playing genre? It's simple. The player the reader, has a character, typically the protagonist of the story, adventuring through a story. The player can make decisions on behalf of that character through prompts at certain points in the story. The decision the player makes corresponds to another page in the book, and based on the decisions the player reader makes, the story can end in multiple different ways. That, in my opinion, makes it a role-playing and the first book in the series touted the multiple ways it could go with the tagline, Choose from 40 Possible Endings. So, as the 1970s faded into the 1980s, we not only saw the birth of the role-playing game, but also its rise in popularity and the beginning of what would truly be a golden age. And with that, we'll bring today's tour to a close. Next week, we'll pick up on the timeline and look at the role-playing game industry in the 1980s. I'm not sure if we'll hit the entire decade in one episode, but we'll start in 1980 and give it a hell of a shot. Okay, I know today's episode was a little bit shorter than usual, and I do want to apologize for that, but I want to add that there's a simple reason. I could have started on into the 1980s, but as I started prepping to do that, I just couldn't find a point that I felt was the right point to cut off. 
plus a nice round single decade made better sense to me for today. Don't have me. I wanted to take a minute to send a shout out to Jolly Blackburn, basically because I can, and I didn't reference it anywhere in this week's episode, probably for the first time in the history of the podcast. Also need to send a shout out to Matt Colville because his Running the Game YouTube series seriously keeps me addicted to creating and causes delays in prepping for this, but we'll get into that another time. Most importantly, a special shout out to you. Thanks for listening and thanks for being a part of my dream. Hey, if you want to support the show, thus support my dream, please tell all of your friends and ask them to leave five-star reviews on whatever source they get their podcasts from. And make sure you leave one yourself. One more quick side note. If you listen to many podcasts, you've heard that leave us a five-star review line a, a, a time or two. It's not necessarily a vanity thing. It's about the algorithms, the programs like Google Play and iTunes use. More five-star reviews get you recommended more and in more places. That's why I'm asking you for help. Five-star reviews can help us get recommended, which can help us build this audience, which means we can do more for the show. And I thank you in advance for your help. As always, you can drop me an email with questions or thoughts to roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the Facebook page and we now have a legit Facebook page, the ability to share included on that and everything. So drop on by and check it out. And you can catch us next week when we check out the role-playing game world in the 1980s. But that's next week. And until then, I'm Wayne Davis. 